thank you so much for coming to this. Um, I, I presented another presentation I'd done for uh, on the hierarchy of engagement, I called it, uh, at another GIB conference. And it was a lot of fun because it was, you know, in a conference room, there's like 25 of us packed into a room and it was just kind of peppered by questions. A lot of people had read the content, but it was just a, like more of a conversation than me speaking to myself uh, and really speaking me, me speaking to a computer screen, um, which is definitely not my favorite thing to do in the world, but it is the world that we live in right now. Um, but like what I'd, I'd really love to make this interactive while at the same time recognize that there is actually a lot of content here. Um, and you're in the right place if you are, you know, a product leader, product founder, um, someone who works on marketplaces or is intrigued by marketplaces, kind of wants to understand marketplaces better. Um, I actually do think that there's a lot you know, the, as, I've been, as I was putting this presentation together and it took just so you know, like this wasn't something that I was like, oh, I just have this hierarchy and I'll just write it down into slides. It took months and months for me to figure, figure this out. Um, but it was really interesting because as I was working on it, I started to recognize the, the patterns that you see in marketplaces and how it applies to so many other areas. My, my um, partners who focus on open source companies talked about open source. Uh, I think of it as user generated content. There's, you know, there's so, so much applicability. And so um, I think it, you know, it could be useful to anybody, but at the same time, like it's definitely a framework to think about how to win if you're building a marketplace. And so you're in the right place if that's something that's interesting to you. But so I'm going to, I'm going to dive in, please, please, uh, you know, interrupt me if you have questions again, I will, I will try to um, go fast and so I can get through things, but, um, but I, so that I can have time for questions. Um, okay, so, you know, marketplaces, they're, why, why are they incredible? They're incredible because you get to a place where you've got a business that is really profitable um, and has strong network effects so that, like, that's how you build real equity value, really re real enduring value. Um, but as everybody knows, like they are one of the hardest things to build because you're basically building two businesses at the same time and using them to create the solution for each other. You have uh, the, the business for the supply side and the business for the demand side. And you're literally creating two products at the same time and then using those two to come together and solve each other's problems. Um, and so very, very difficult. And so the question that I think about um, a lot is how do you maximize your chances of, of getting to that place where you've, that you've won? I'll skip this, but a lot of marketplace experience, a lot of um, institutional experience, I benchmark on marketplaces. Um, and for me, it's both you know, as, a, as a board member, investor, and then also operator where you know, Pinterest, which is where I, I led product for the discovery team, um, is a UGC site, but it is a marketplace where you've got content, you know, which is a supply and the people who bring that supply in and then the viewers, which is the demand side. <clears throat> so uh, and I'm apologize for the pace, but I just want to make sure we, we get time for questions. So there, you know, this is the hierarchy and there's, there's basically three levels that we're going to talk about. The first is the um, focus. The second and then is tipping the marketplace and the third is dominating, um, which is becoming number one by a wide margin. But really the core insight behind this marketplace is that, um, or this hierarchy is that if you want to, if you kind of think of domination, which is that is the goal, like you want to be number one by a wide margin, that's when you build the, the business that I described before. In order to get that, you, have to, you actually have to start from that goal of domination and then work backwards from there to figure out what your strategy is to get to that point. And so if you want to dominate the market, you, you, like you wanna be number one by a wide margin, you have to tip the market towards you. And so I'll talk about what that means, how to tip the market. And if you want to tip the market, then it means you have to be so much better than any substitute. And the only way you can do that is by being just like laser focused on a constrained problem. 
And so let's start with that focus. Um, so, you know, everybody, like one of the things that is really difficult about marketplaces and everybody talks about this is like solving the chicken or the egg problem. You know, you have, how do you get the supply side? If you don't have the demand side, how do you get the demand side if there's no supply? Um, and there's a lot of great content written there, like by, you know, the practitioners, the operators. And so I, I won't get into how to actually do this, but the mistake I see a lot of founders do is that they are incredible at these tactics. You know, they, they get uh, transactions going, they come in and the, the numbers are going up and to the right. But the, the, the miss here, um, and again, if you start from the goal of domination and work backwards, is that your goal isn't to grow transactions. And actually, if you optimize for growing transactions, it'll take you away from your ability to get to that dominant number one position. And really what your goal is, is to grow transactions that make your buyers and sellers, but particularly your buyers, like with the marketplace, you need supply, yes, but like it really is about the value proposition for the buy side almost all the time. Um, you, you, know, you have to create meaningfully more happiness than any substitute when those transactions happen. So I kind of think of it as happy GMB, like forget GMB, that's a vanity metric, but are you, are you growing GMV where the transactions are meaningfully happier than the buyer, than, than any other substitute? And I'm just going to give a few examples just to articulate why I think GMV itself is a vanity metric and why focusing on this kind of happiness concept is, will focus you in the right directions. So obviously a, a case study near and dear to our heart, Sarah, Bernard, would appreciate that like as a New Yorker, you know, taxis, like I, you know, I'll admit when Uber first came out, I was like, that sounds like a San Francisco idea, but it'll never work in New York City. But you know, the, like what, you know, what did Uber do? Uber had this transformative product experience. And so it didn't matter how much bigger taxis were, like scale was irrelevant to Uber's ability to, to win the market. Um, DoorDash versus Postmates, like DoorDash started a year and a half after Postmates. They used almost the same tactics. Like it was, it was an identical playbook in many regards, and yet DoorDash won. So why? And then I love this example also because, I mean, you can see here, oh, where's my mouse? I guess you can't see because I can't move my mouse around. Um, but there's a hundred, like if you do a search on eBay for uh, Nike sneakers, and I just did this recently, there were a hundred and almost 170,000 results for Nike sneakers. So the scale of eBay in sneakers is massive. And yet e GOAT has become the category leader. So why? They all won because it's really irrelevant to the buyer how happy you make them versus, you know, I'm sorry, it's irrelevant to the buyer how big you are. Like, it just doesn't matter. What matters to a buyer when they come into your marketplace is, and, and then actually consummate a transaction is how much happier they, you make them versus any substitute. Um, and when I say happy, it's kind of this encapsulation of the entire experience you have end to end. So the efficiency and the strength of the match the, the economics that you have, the trust, you know, how, how easy is the experience overall. And so your, your, the process, and this, is, this will always be your job um, when you're building a marketplace, is this relentless pursuit of exceeding expectations in order to create happiness. And I say it's a relentless pursuit and, and it's about expectations. And this is, you know, a, a Be uh, uh, Bezos talks about this, which is that, you know, consumers, were, there are expectations of what the, the floor is of an experience. It's constantly rising. And so this is, you know, you obviously want to leapfrog whatever the incumbents provide in terms of the experience itself. But as I'll get into later, you can't rest on your laurels. It's a constant pursuit. And so to do this, um, you have to focus. And like, you know, I think of as like everybody wants to build a big company, but if you start by trying to boil the ocean, you're, you're going to be, you're going to try to be everything for everyone and you're never really going to 
create something great. And so instead, what you want to do is you focus on a thimble. You focus on this like white hot center of a problem where you can really nail the value proposition relative to any other substitute. Um, you know, DoorDash went after restaurants in the Bay Area suburbs. Like no one else was focused on there. There, you know, the best way to become number one is to have no competition, right? Or really sucky competition. So they went after the suburbs. It was underappreciated. There was, you know, the competition was barely anything because it wasn't actually economic to provide the service there. But it let them just nail the value proposition for a group of people who were like starved in the desert for delivery. Um, while Postmates, on the other hand, went after big GMV. They went after San Francisco, so much bigger potential GMV than any of the suburbs, but there was a lot of competition. Um, and they went after a lot of different categories. So they really diffused their focus across cafes, restaurants, retailers. Like I remember the Apple store and bicycles and you know, Starbucks, like all these things. Um, and, and they were in this constant battle then across all the competition that they had. Um, so so the, the, you know, think about how much easier it is for DoorDash to be like 10x better than any substitute when there's no, there's really no delivery whatsoever in, in the suburbs versus uh, Postmates where their execution was just gonna have to be like a thousand X better than DoorDash's because there was so much competition that they were already facing in San Francisco. I wanna, uh, any, uh, I can keep on going, but feel free to raise your hand or, um, the, second, the second thing then is that, you know, if, if you, if you're, okay, focus, you know, GOAT went after this overlooked, underappreciated, vulnerable vertical on eBay, which is secondhand sneakers, Uber going after black cars. Um, and so your, your focus, and then you want to use, like, there's always an orientation towards supply side acquisition in marketplaces. And obviously that's critical, but you also want to use product and policies. And actually that's where the step function changes happen largely in these marketplaces. So you're using product and policies um, to maximize the happiness there. And I, I say policies because I think this GOAT example is just a super useful example to talk about where they had the assurance of authenticity. So it was actually a policy decision that they made, which was that they were gonna make sure that everything they sold was authentic and, and that they, they had their own process for, for validating the authenticity of any supply that they would, that they would uh, put on their marketplace. Um, that was the way that they disrupted eBay. Um, and actually the story behind GOAT is that they were, it was like a, a, a startup, another startup that was uh, running on fumes. The, the founders were brainstorming um, a pivot and then one of the founders got a pair of sneakers he'd bought off of eBay, opened up the box and they were counterfeits. And that was the, this is something that we should change. Um, Uber, as you guys all know, like just what a disruptive leapfrogging of the experience um, of taxis. Um, when it was, you know, they said faster, better and cheaper than a taxi. Like that is, that's the maximization of happiness that you can create. And so how do you know then if you're creating enough happiness? You know, I kind of, I say 10x happier, like how, how do you know? Um, and, and, and kind of what I recommend is like, first you want to have a hunch of what do you think is the experience that will be meaningfully better for your buyers and sellers than any substitute. Um, so it could be like, let's say you are starting, you know, the next Uber, or let's say you were, you were starting Uber. And so you could have a hypothesis that I think that someone should open up the app and within five minutes they get a car and then they rate that driver a four or a five. So you have these two things, oh, you know, open up, get the car within five minutes and rate it four or five. And so if someone kind of checks, if there's an experience that checks those two boxes, I'll count that as what I, I call it happy GMB. And you're tracking the percentage of people that you can create that experience for. And it gives you like clarity on the operational levers that you need to attack in order to make sure that you're, in, you're kind of on the right path. But then ultimately it's all about net revenue retention because the whole point is if someone has a happy experience with you, 
then they should come back to your experience. And so maybe it turns out that the four or five on the rating actually doesn't matter. And it's more, if you get the car within three minutes, then you're guaranteed to come back. Like I, these are made up numbers. Don't presume I know anything inside. Um, and so, and so that's the idea. And so, you know, what you want to get to then is a place where, of course, and, and I say like, I've been saying, hey, look, let's not focus on growing right now. Let's, we're focused on getting the core experience right so that you have a foundation to worry about growing. Um, but how do you know whether it's time to start thinking about growing and that's thinking about tipping the market and that's when you get to this concept I call minimum viable happiness, which is basically you're able to grow um, your GMV and, and acquire buyers and sellers in a way where enough of them end up sticking with you. And my friend Casey Winter said, yeah, I love this quote, you, you know your users are happy, not when they stop complaining, because they will always complain, um, but when they stop leaving. And so you want to get to a point like where you're, you start to see your cohorts plateau. Um, and that means that like there's a segment of buyers and sellers that you have, you've nailed it. You've gone into a place where you are meaningfully better than any substitute for them and they stick with you. And, and, and exactly where that plateau happens will actually depend a lot on what vertical you're, you're going after because you know, if you go to travel, um, you can imagine that the supply side should have actually greater than 100% net revenue retention because you want to find the supply and then the good ones stick around and they get more and more popular. But on the demand side, people don't travel every other day, especially not now. Um, and so you're gonna, the cohorts are gonna look very, very different on the demand side, but, the, but you have to have uh, the right mix of retention on both sides and, and acquisition costs on both sides so that the retention that you're getting to on both sides supports your go-to-market costs in the beginning. Um, and, and usually what I've seen in my experience is that usually, although there's definitely exceptions, um, you'll have one side that will have greater than 100% net revenue retention even in the beginning. Um, and so before I go on to level two, let me pause and, and see, um, any questions? I know I, I, I am going fast. Sam, I, I want to ask your question. Hi. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry, good. I um, don't see the chat thing. So, yeah, please. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll call it out. I'm, I'm, I'm Dan Storms. I work at a company called Cook Unity. Um, we've, we've chatted with you oh, before. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, nice yeah. To, How uh, are you? Yeah. Nice to connect with you. Um, you. We're, um, I'm, I'm interested in this idea. You're talking where about happiness and a lot of the newer marketplaces you mentioned are more managed than some of the say older ones that are less managed. Is that, uh, is there a correlation there or is that, those are just the examples that, that happen to come out recently? Oh, interesting. I, um, yeah, you know, I think that's a technique people have been using lately uh, to, to kind of, um, to try to leapfrog incumbents. Like there is a lot of work that traditional marketplaces make buyers go through in order to find the supply side, the, the supplier that they end up matching with. Um, and one way, you know, Uber, this is part of the magic that Uber created, is to take that completely away from the from the, the user and just make it so simple and effortless and remove all the friction of that match. And so I think it's uh, I think it's a technique people are using now that, to great effect. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Yeah. I think, you know, the one thing is, excuse me, is that, um, you know, there is also a point at which you do have to let go. Um, and, and, uh, and I think that's different for, you know, there's managed as there's, there's, I see a lot of companies that think of themselves as marketplaces, but they have, there's, there's so much management of the supply that they end up feeling more like an e-commerce company than an actual marketplace. And so, there is a spectrum just to be to be aware of because it is always how do you how do you have more leverage on the buy side and the sell side over time so the network effect really kicks in. Any other questions? Okay. Um, 
Oh, sorry, I, I have a quick question. Um, Please. So I, you had a slide on overlooked markets. So sorry, my name is Jessica. I'm working on my own startup. Um, so your question on overlooked markets was, I, I like the example of DoorDash and Postmates. And you mentioned DoorDash went after the suburbs that was starving for, for supply and, and, and this service. Um, how, do you, how do you think about whether it's actually an overlooked market that has a chance of success and is a good place to sort of test out your, your value proposition versus the flip side, which is people were telling them this will never work, economically not viable, you need yeah. cars to drive long distances. Like how do you actually distill that out to say this is actually worth investing in versus no, you're right, this will never work. I love the question. Um, so two, two thoughts there. Number one is that you know, it's like what uh, Tony from DoorDash, I heard him on a panel talk about, is he's like, look, we had a hypothesis and our hypothesis was that if we, um, if we, if we worked with restaurants that didn't have their own delivery, we would be able to have a transformative experience on the, on the demand side. Um, and you know, this was a world like before, actually Postmates was the, the innovator here. Tony kind of stole the idea, I think from Postmates. But um, the, the idea was that if you, like there was a lot of food delivery, Grubhub being the, the incumbent, but they only really worked with restaurants that had their own delivery vehicle, their own delivery fleet. And so you had this constraint to the supply side. And so the insight that Postmates had and then DoorDash, I believe copied, was that if you could do delivery for companies, for restaurants that don't have delivery, and that therefore dramatically expand the supply side that you would have a disruptive experience for the demand side. Um, and what DoorDash did in the beginning, and so that was kind of their hypothesis. And then they used the suburbs to prove that hypothesis because it was a place where it was like incredibly acute. And then their, their belief was that if we could prove the hypothesis in that market and get to a dominant place, that we would then be able to use that same playbook in other places and get to a point, I mean, and they worked hard to get to a place where the unit economics, um, I wouldn't say worked, but you could see line of sight on it working. Um, and that was that, and then, and then the belief was, and this is kind of leads to the second thing, which is that you want to make sure that where you're proving something isn't a dead end. That if you then kind of take like, you know, I always think of it as like you pull the thread of the buyer need, but if you like, you know, DoorDash was proving the hypothesis in a market and then they could apply that hypothesis and that, that playbook into that same value proposition into other markets. Um, sometimes though, what people do is they start off in a category that is constrained. And, and the thing that I would think about there, I, I wrote about in my blog, there's a, I, I actually get into this a little bit more on my medium, which is that you wanna make sure that you're not starting in a dead end. And the way to make sure you're not starting in a dead end, um, because there are a lot of things that have been overlooked, but it's actually because they're crappy markets, is that you have to th ask yourself, if I solve this problem for my buy side, um, if I pull the thread of my buyer, will I, will I get more and more opportunity for repeat use cases with that, with that buyer? Is there, is there more that I can sell to that buyer with the, the same or an expansion of my supply side that, um, that like will just let me have more and more, more and more engagement with my, with my buyers? And it's actually, I'll talk about this a little bit more in level three, but does that answer your questions? Yeah, that's super helpful. Thank you. So let me zoom into level two, um, just because I, I don't want to run out of time for level three. So tipping. So now, okay, we've got minimum viable happiness. So we've, you've, you've got a value proposition that's resonating, that's better than any substitute. And now we get to think about um, tipping the market. So tipping is this idea that in, in, if you've ever experienced what it feels like when your network effect comes alive, it's the coolest thing. Because what's happening is you're pushing a bottle up a hill, like you're doing all these things that don't scale um, in order to get your flywheel spinning in a way. And then all of a sudden stuff, you know, 
the ball really, it does feel like it goes over the other side where it just starts to get easier. And all of a sudden you see two things that happen, which is first you start to see that your existing cohorts are retaining better. And what I mean is like they're, they're like starting to do more transactions. The, the new cohorts, <laughs> if you compare them against older cohorts, are actually more engaged, doing more transactions, they're more valuable. But then the real sign is that you start to see organic demand um, for your product from both the buy side and the supply side. And so if it, it used to be that like you were, you know, you had some organic growth, but really most of your buyers and sellers were coming to you through paid channels. Then all of a sudden what you start to see is that the organic growth of your marketplace is growing and growing as a percentage of total acquisition because, and that's happening just because you've become so obviously the right, like the best choice. And that's happening because as you're growing, well, I'll say here, it happens because as you're growing, you can see that you, as you go up the chart, what happens in a marketplace is that the happiness that you're able to create for the buy side and the su supply side is a function of how much you've penetrated the market. And so as you're growing, your network effect is starting to mean that the buy side and the supply side have a better and better experience. Like you think about Uber with like increased utilization, you have more riders, which makes more utilization for the drivers. So they make more money, which makes more drivers want to come, which makes a better value proposition for the, for the, the riders. And so once you have the network effects start to happen, you see that flywheel start to go around and around. That's when you get propelled over that curve I talked about and it, and it tips. And so that means like you, you have to start thinking about growth. But the key is, is that if you started by doing all these things that don't scale in order to grow, now you have to figure out systematic ways of growing. Um, and I think of this as, as tipping loops. So, um, and, I, and I think there's kind of two loops that two types of loops that work together to create momentum for you systematically. Um, so the first is uh, just these growth focused loops. And the idea very simply is use your existing buyers and suppliers, sellers to acquire buyers and sellers for you. And it just becomes a really scalable channel. Uh, you know, supplier, you know, a driver likes driving and they t make it easy for them to tell their friends and then they'll bring on drivers. Um, you, you make a reservation on hip camp to go camping or glamping um, and you naturally invite five of your friends because they're gonna come with you. And, that, and by doing that, you're letting people know about hip camp. So you're kind of using the existing energy you have from your buyers and sellers to acquire more buyers and sellers for you. Um, the, the second type of loop is what I call happiness loops. And basically what they do is they let you scale your supply without hurting the happiness that you create for your buy side. Um, and so search ranking is just like one of those easy ways where you, you, know, you find ways to make sure that the experience you wanna create for the buy side is, is part of your ranking algorithm. So you know, Uber Eats, they, thought, they believed in the beginning that their superpower relative to any other delivery network was going to be the speed to which you get your order. And so they reinforced that, that expectation and value in the search ranking, which let, leads to this experience of you know, buyers getting their food faster on, uh, on Uber Eats because even the restaurants that they would choose were biased towards ones that would perform that, that experience. Um, <laughs> Reputation is another classic, classic uh, loop where, you know, if a buyer, you know, Airbnb buyer has a good experience, leaves a review, the host reputation increases, which means more buyers will convert with that host and therefore have a better experience themselves. So their, their retention increases. And you actually, like one interesting thing with this loop is that you're, the point is, to churn the bad supply. Like you want people to have an experience with great suppliers and you want a way of like filtering out the bad supply. You can think of it almost like the kidneys of your marketplace. 
And so that's, that's the idea here is like you want things to, the good stuff to flow to the top and the bad stuff to get less and less of your buyers over time. And that's what these loops are all about, the happiness loops. And so then your job when you're building a marketplace is to identify these loops and maximize them. So before I just said, hey, make it easy for your drivers to tell a friend about Uber. But if you pay them to do it and you, you reward them for telling another friend, like drivers were writing blog posts about how much they loved Uber and they were making more money. Some drivers were making more money acquiring drivers and getting the referral bonus than they were actually driving, but that's okay. That's, that's, you, if you have that loop spinning, you're, you're going to be happy. Um, super certification and badges is another way of doing this, which is that you, you, you kind of just, it's not just a rating system, but it's saying, Hey, let's say what a super host means on Airbnb, um, which is they respond through to, uh, the, um, what did Airbnb call their people? I guess just like guests, they, they respond to their guests really quickly. They have a great experience. They have a certain number of like four and a half stars or whatever it is. Um, you get a super host. And then if you get that badge, first of all, everybody wants that badge because it shows in search and it increases conversion and it feels good to get it. Um, and then they have higher conversion rates and the travelers get a better experience. So it's a way for Airbnb to really superpower um, this uh, reputation loop. And so, you know, you're, you're kind of focused um, on these loops, like identifying them, enabling them, maximizing them. But then you also want to always be looking for ways to reduce friction that you have in any transaction so that the loops kind of can spin faster and faster. It's almost, think about re removing friction as a way of greasing the skids of your, of your loops. Um, and so like the, um, I forgot the guy's name from Cooks Unity asked this question about managed marketplaces. It's one of the ways people remove friction in this, um, you know, this first thing on the, on the right side, how hard is it to find and choose a match? Um, if, you, if you are doing it for them, or you know, making sure, like actually making sure that the supply side is going to be all good, then you remove a lot of friction from that side. Um, there's just so many places where people have friction, and it's a constant, constant process of removing that friction because the less friction you have, the happier everybody will be. Um, so, not you know, one of the questions I got was like, how do you know if? Uh, the marketplaces that you're going after is overlooked. Um, I didn't, I, I didn't want to go into this part yet, but now I get to talk about it. Because one of the things that you have to make sure when you go after a market is that it's actually going to be susceptible to tipping. Um, because again, you want to get to dominance, so you have to be able to tip. Um, and so if you're going after a market that you can't tip, then you're going to be in trouble. So how do you make sure the market you're going after will be susceptible to tipping? Watch out for these six hurdles. And I'm going to go through these super quickly. One, competition. Obvious, like if you have competition, you know, it's going to be a lot harder to, for you to be so much better than any alternative. So, you know, the less competition, the crappier your competition, the better. Um, and, and, uh, and, you know, don't make yourself vulnerable, but I'll, these posts are all, these slides are all on my medium. So I'm going through them quickly so we can do more Q and A, but you can read the detail later. Low fragmentation, classic, you know, you need, uh, you know, if, if there's concentration, you're never going to get the buyers or sellers, depending on what side is concentrated to lean in on your marketplace and to care about your marketplace because they've already won. And so you have to make sure it's fragmented. Um, you know, uh, some marketplaces, Groupon got into this trouble, ClassPass. Like sometimes you create such a strong value proposition for the buy side that as you grow and you try to tip, the, the supply says, says, hey, wait a moment, this is not working for me. And they start churning. And so you have to be very hyper vigilant constantly especially when your marketplace is going through hyper growth, that you're having enough value on both sides of the market. Regulation, obvious, like there, you know, for a while, um, 
you know, there's just so many ways in which I've seen regulation shut down marketplaces um, and enable them. And so you just have to be hyper vigilant here. Um, homogeneity on the buy side need. And the idea is, is like, you know, I, I had that curve before where I said, the more you penetrate the market, the stronger your value gets for the buy side. But that's only if there's a heterogeneity in the need of the buy side. So like Airbnb, every unit of supply you add means that I can find the little snowflake, you know, place that I want to stay that's in the right neighborhood with the right aesthetic for the right number of bedrooms at the right cost. Like, you know, everybody has a little bit of a different feeling of what that is when you're on Airbnb. But like when you're on Mechanical Turk, the whole point is that it's a commoditized labor pool. And so once you get to like 5% of that labor pool, there's no need for you to add any incremental unit of supply because the value proposition to the buy side is already satiated, which means that they never win the market. It's very easy for another marketplace with this type of value proposition to get up and running. And so they never tip the market. Um, you know, this is one of the things that my partner Bill talks about a lot, which is that there's a lot of marketplaces that aggregate supply, but never actually corner the buy side. And what I mean by corner is like, if, you know, I, there's like ZocDoc, um, Thumbtack, there's a lot of marketplaces where the, the, the um, experience doesn't happen frequent enough for the buyer to think to come to you in order to access a supplier. And so what you have to do is you're constantly using SEO and other things to try to catch the buyer when they're doing the search that they want them to do. But so you never actually get to really own the buyer. Like I open up my phone and I go to Uber Eats or DoorDash, whatever it is. I'm not doing a search on Google to find a, you know, the restaurant I want and then, you know, see if there's a food delivery network there that wants to service it for me, you know? I go to my app and that means they own me. They've cornered me as the buyer and that's the experience you need to have. Otherwise, you're just lead gen for the supply side. Okay, level two. Um, I've got, I think it's 15 minutes or so. You've got um, about 10. But we started five minutes late, so that's why I said 15. Uh, <laughs> but we'll see. Uh, so tell me about uh, any questions on, on level two. Hey, Sarah. Yeah. Yeah, hi, this is Prasad. Um, quick question on uh, anti-incumbency. How do you sort of make sure that um, you know, the marketplaces don't always skew to the supply side, suppliers who've been on the longest? Hmm. So what I always think about is it's actually, there's, you know, I think you're talking about, there's a rich get richer effect that you always want to be careful about because you want to make sure that you're activating your new supply. So like, you know, it's much easier for a buyer to work with a supplier that already has reviews than it is for them to work with a supplier who's never been reviewed and activate that supplier and then review them because there's just a lot of, um, you know, it's just obvious, like an unknown or a known quantity. And, and, um, and at the same time, like there is something to be said about the experience with a known quantity is going to be better for the buyer. Um, what I've seen as a technique that people do is they, they um, do have a boost that they do to new suppliers in search to make sure that they're getting exposure to, to actual eyeballs. Um, and having some kind of mix there so that me as a buyer will see a mix of people who already are, are good um, and are rated in known quantities, but then also have these like, um, these cur not curveballs, but you know, some, some other analogy where there, is, there might be a diamond in the rough and then they end up deciding to go with it. So you wanna have a mixture, but also recognize that there's something, you know, there's a reason why uh, marketplaces end up having kind of what I refer to as like the new incumbents, you know, the power sellers, um, because the people, the sellers who are most leaning in on your platform are the ones providing the best service to your buyers. And so it's not the worst thing to happen. You just want to make sure that there's an activation process that you're enabling. 
Any other questions? Hey, Sarah. Uh, I'm Roshni. I lead um, consumer product at Eventbrite uh, under Casey. Um, oh, cool. Uh, nice to meet you. Um, oh, so your last point on the aggregating the buy side, I think is really interesting. And, and you talked a little bit about frequency as some of the challenges like a ZocTalk or Thumbtack might yeah. face there. But then if I think about like Airbnb, that's probably also not a super high frequency purchase. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious if you have some insights on like, is it just frequency or is it something about um, <laughs> maybe the type of transaction or, or just the fact that they got so big that it became a, a default type of, of place to to go from a buy side perspective. I just think, and this is a problem that uh, Airbnb is facing now, but in the early days when they were able to solidify their brand is that their value proposition was just 10,000 X the incumbent, you know, it was so much better. It was 10 X, you know, I call, I always say marketplaces tend to have a 10 X better experience and provide that experience cheaper. And that's like, the recipe for mass market. Um, and what Airbnb had was just so disruptive and just so much better than anything else and cheaper that one experience was enough to own it in the consumer's mind and have people come back to it. Um, and I think that like sometimes what happens with like a ZocDoc as an example is that there's just not enough surface area of that ex in, in the kind of consumer's experience of that transaction that they don't remember it. It just, it didn't, it didn't leave an impression on them. And so you, they have to constantly acquire. All right, I'm gonna, otherwise Sarah's gonna cut me off. I'm gonna run into uh, Dominate. We're, we can go um, an extra, yeah, keep going. Okay, cool. We can go till uh, two, 225-ish, okay. that's the time. Um, and just so everybody knows, the closing session won't start until uh, 11.35, California. It's not my fault. No, <laughs> no it's not. I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna dive in. Um, okay, so I, I say like, all right, so how, okay, we're, we're growing, we're tipping the market. Now is the fun part, which is how do you win? So as I said before, I kind of started off saying like, it's not enough to be number one. You want to be number one by a wide margin, but why is that true? So it's actually uh, an insight I, I, um, I stole from this uh, company called Shipstead and Shipstead has this, um, this portfolio of online classified companies. It's a super interesting business. You should definitely read about it. And they did this analysis of all their online classifieds and online classified, think of it as Craigslist. Um, and, and they had online classifieds that were like vertical focus, like cars, um, or, you know, just generic online classifieds. And what they found was that the, the contribution margin of their online classified site was a function of how much bigger that site was in their category and geography relative to the number two player. And so if they were neck and neck with another marketplace, another classified site, then there was like no profit margin because they were always having to spend money in order to try to grow. You know, when you're neck and neck with someone, you're just every point of additional market share that you can get is super valuable. And it's why, like, if you guys remember when the food delivery wars were happening in the early days, like, if you got a delivery that was like two minutes late and you like complained even just a little bit to like DoorDash or Postmates or Uber Eats or whoever it was, they would send you like a $25 gift certificate. They would refund your delivery because, because for them, they were neck and neck with each other to compete and win. And, and they did anything that they could for that, for that repeat, that next purchase to get the market share. And so, when you're in this dog fight, you don't create, you're not actually, even if your GMV is going up, you're not creating any equity value because you have no contribution. You can't, you're, you're subsidizing the growth. But if once you get to a point of dominance, that's when you get the profit margins that we all dream of in marketplaces. And so you, um, that's the goal. Number one, buy a wide margin. The, the bigger you are, the more profitable you'll be. And, and so you, and you want to do that in each market, like each market you win and get to dominance will let you go after new markets. And so each market you win makes you stronger too. And so I love this picture. I don't know why I think it's the most amazing picture. It's time to dominate the competition. 
Um, what a cool image. So how, how you run your race depends on your competitive landscape. And so let's start with, and sorry, that's an important point. Like, <clears throat> as I said before, it's relative to your competition, your competitive set. And so if you have no competition, then you are running hard at it. You are first, you know, go slow to go fast, get your playbook right. Like DoorDash, I mean, sorry, Grubhub actually in the early days, I think took three years to get their playbook right in Chicago before growing into other cities and they were very careful. But once you nail your playbook, which is the level one and level two actions that you took, you want to just get that marketplace, uh, those loops spinning in as many cities as you can handle because you're, you're grabbing, you're, you're, you're doing the land grab. Um, and, and then in parallel, what you're doing is you're looking to expand the use case for the buy side um, to find more re repeat usage. And so, you know, Uber went from black car to Uber X to pool. They kept on expanding. Now you, I mean, then they had scooters, but they kept on expanding the use cases that they solve for to get more repeat usage, more share of wallet. Airbnb, very similar. The warning scenario that I always talk about, you know, there was a period of time when Etsy was actually about to go public. They started to chase GMV. And what that looked like was that they actually started to let anything onto the marketplace. They had all this mass manufactured stuff from China and Turkey and other countries. And it completely degraded the trust that they had created with their buyers and sellers because it was supposed to be their brand stood for handcrafted one of a kind goods. And then all of a sudden there was all this crap on Etsy. I fought a lot of it at, at Pinterest. I was sending them angry emails all the time about all the crap. And, then, and, it, and they actually ended up firing their CEO, bringing on someone new who cleaned things up because they really lost themselves for a while. And now like, it's just an unbelievable runaway company. Um, when there is competition, what I always tell founders is <coughs> don't try to take on more cities um, if you're not already 2x uh, your largest competitor in your core. Um, and so if you're not 2x, then you got to keep focused um, or cut your losses. So Postmates is my example here. Those guys like went, you know, they were just super aggressive going after GMV. Um, they went after, uh, you know, San Francisco, but then it was DC and New York City and all these cities. And at the end of the day, most of the value that they created was LA. And any dollar that they put into New York City, for example, was a complete and utter waste of money. It was incinerating money. And actually, it's worse than incinerating money because it's not just that you put $100 into New York City and it created no value. It's that that $100 should have gone to Los Angeles, as an example, to increase the lead that Postmates had over DoorDash in LA. Um, and so you have to be thinking of it as like an investor would, which is if for every dollar I have, how do I maximize the ROI of that dollar? And you put it into the place where, that, where you most have the highest probability of domination. And if you don't have a chance, then like don't have an ego about it and move out of the city. If you are greater than 2x your largest competitor in your core, then you could basically do that land grab playbook that I talked about. But instead of it being 100% towards land grab, you're, you're focused towards land grab, but don't forget that the competition's coming after you. <coughs> and make sure that you're still extending your lead in your core market. <coughs> and, um, and, and just kind of the last thing, which is, you know, uh, it pays to be paranoid, like never rest on your laurels. Like these were all the incumbents. They all thought they won and yet they got leapfrogged by um, other competitors. Uh, Airbnb leapfrogged home away, DoorDash, Uber Eats leapfrogged Grubhub um, and obviously Goat, but there's so many vertical competitors that have leapfrogged eBay. And so paranoia, paranoia, uh, always be expectations are always raising and so keep pushing that's it so what um <coughs> I have time for some slides and Sarah's gonna make me show this but um <laughs> I uh 
So uh, any, any questions? Mark, Stephen, um, you had a couple of questions in the chat along with Adrita. Yeah, yeah. So my question, you gave an example, and maybe you kind of answered this, of GOAT versus eBay. Well, really that's, eBay is much larger, but it's many, many different verticals, right? And so when you're talking about being a factor different, and I'm thinking this in my own company because I focus on career and product right? And our competitors are Indeed and LinkedIn, right? The big people. Um, and so like go, do, do you need to be 2x better than eBay in your vertical? Like do we need to be 2x better than LinkedIn and Indeed in our vertical? How does that work? How, what, yeah, I sense? mean it's always like, oh so first of all 2x ain't gonna cut it. Okay. You gotta be a lot better than 2x. Um, otherwise you'll just, you'll um, It'll still be a dog fight. Um, so, but yes, it's it's versus the substitute. So if a buyer's coming to you, as an example, some a candidate's coming to you, they could go to, there's a lot of choices that they could go to. How is your experience going to be 10x better than those, those other substitutes? That's what it's always the buyer need, you know, from the mindset of that person. What, are, what else are they considering and how much stronger is your value proposition for them? Okay. Thanks. Yeah, hi, Sarah, my question. Very, very informative presentation. So thank you so much. Uh, my question was around Shopify. What do you think Shopify did uh, differently to get this kind of a market share? Well, so Shopify, what they did is it's, it's, I love, I was just thinking about this. So, you know, one of the things that you see, so Shopify, let's start with, is that it's not a marketplace, it's a SaaS company, but it's absolutely relevant here because what Shopify did is if, if you think about it as like um, supply side and the demand side, the supply side was e-commerce software. And the demand side was people who wanted access to, who wanted to start their own online store. But the problem was, was that the existing incumbents on the supply side were these really crappy software products that had a lot of friction. And what Shopify did was that they democratized the, the supply side. They made it so much easier for someone to uh, start a store that it, it, it meant that if you had to have like super high interest and motivation to start the store and ability that suddenly you did it, it was so much easier and so it dramatically increased the demand side that could start a store and that was a disruptive experience to the market and then they kept on making it easier and more powerful on the supply side which was their product to make it you know just so much better than any alternative so we need to cut it off and head to the main stage. Sarah, this was fantastic. And thank you, everybody. And sorry about the late start. Thank you, everybody. And thanks for the questions. Please fill out your survey and we will pass all the feedback along. Yeah, and I really would welcome what's, uh, you know, this is, I think, the second time I've presented this to a group. So, uh, um, Anything that's not clear or clear, uh, let me know.